Three back at Cape Canaveral now, the Kennedy Space Center, where we have the Columbia sitting out on its launch pad, due to be launched tomorrow morning, the space shuttle. A lot of excitement here, but we've got to stand back a little bit from it this morning and talk about whether it's worth all the money and the cost overruns, and to help us do that is Bob Bazell. Uh, we've been talking about the fact that uh, NASA has been promoting this very heavily, but a lot of people think it'll end up being used primarily for military purposes and not for all the industrial and scientific purposes right. that they say. Well, ever since the uh, shuttle was approved by the government in 1972, there have been these questions about its usefulness, whether it's really worth all the costs. And there's two questions. One is the military one, whether it's really for the military. And the other is whether the cost of the shuttle is going to hurt other space projects, such as planetary Dr. science. Dr. Robert Novick of Columbia University has designed one of the first scientific experiments to be carried by the space shuttle. It's a device to measure x-rays from the sun, and it is scheduled to go up sometime in 1982. There's no other way we could do this, this research at the present time without the shuttle. There are many other experiments that will go in the shuttle's cargo bay in the next two decades. And even though they all provide some valuable information, many scientists believe that it will not be nearly enough to justify the billions of dollars spent on the shuttle. And we had a space agency that was dominated by people who were interested in manned space programs. Dr. George Rathjens of MIT. There was a bureaucracy there that wanted to perpetuate itself and perpetuate the situation with large budgets. Space science wouldn't have taken that much. They had to have something, so they pushed the shuttle. And the shuttle took so much money that it's simply not been possible to fund the kind of uh, space uh, exploration and space science that I think we could have had and should have had. The space science which we have had, such as these pictures sent back from Saturn by Voyager, has been spectacular. But this sort of exploration has been sharply cut back because of the cost of the shuttle. Many projects for the future have been abandoned. For example, Halley's Comet, which last appeared in 1910, returns to our part of the universe in 1986. And many researchers wanted to send up a satellite to look at it. That won't happen. NASA officials who support the shuttle say the scientists who are complaining don't understand political realities. Dr. Robert Jastrow. There's no question but that uh, man in space is the driving thrust in NASA. It always has been that way. My colleagues never understood that. They always think that if you could get man in space out of space out of the space program, you could do more science. But if you got man in space out of the space program, there'd be no space program. Because people have supported, they supported Kennedy originally, in his uh, decision to go to the moon because they had a gut feeling that learning how to fly in space was something we needed to do when a hostile power, a potentially hostile power, was operating, maneuvering out there. Another problem with the shuttle, according to many critics, is that even though it has been paid for with civilian funds, the major beneficiary will be the military. The Pentagon is now increasingly preoccupied with the possibilities of space wars in the future, and the shuttle was redesigned to accommodate the military's requirements for transporting these sort of devices into space. Well, I don't object to using it for those purposes, but it seems to me that when the shuttle was designed to meet, meet military specifications, when a large part of the cost is due to that, and when the most significant payloads will be military payloads, it should have been defended on those grounds and in competition with other military programs. Dr. Jaster argues that no matter how it was paid for, the shuttle is justified by is, military threats from the uh, Soviets. They know that space is an important arena for the Marxist system to demonstrate a superiority in, and they're out there working as hard as they can. They're building killer satellites, uh, laser weapons, and uh, working as hard as they can to make it into a military arena. I don't think we can afford to let them do that without a response. Even the severest critics say that since we have the shuttle now, we should try to get as much use out of it as possible. But a strong suspicion remains that NASA built the shuttle first, then began searching for justifications for having it. And the best justification now seems to be its military uses. NASA did try hard to sell space in the shuttle in future uh, shots. Well, it's still selling. The best thing is for launching satellites, but the question is still whether it's worth it or would it have been worth it to do it the old-fashioned way. The rest of the applications so far, industries regarded them as something as a joke. Yeah, business has not exactly been rushing to buy space in there. That's right. Okay. We'll be back. Tom? Yes, sir. I'm a PFC down here, a performance flight certification. That's what we're giving you this morning. NASA has 261 pages of acronyms. You'll be hearing most of them in the next couple of days as we report live here. Time now for an SB. Station break. Good morning, everyone. This is today, Thursday, April the 9th, and you are looking at live pictures of Mission Control in Houston. 
which will be a very busy place tomorrow morning if all goes well here at Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center, where that, the Columbia Space Shuttle, will be launched by the two solid rocket boosters that you see on either side, fueled by that large gas tank, in effect, the external tank. That's the largest canister that you can see there sitting out on the pad in the Florida sunshine this morning. The weather looks very good. We're at T-minus 12 and holding, but everything is in good shape. They're holding only because they've caught up with all of their work, and they'll resume the countdown, we are told, at 4 o'clock this afternoon, about 4.20, actually, Eastern Standard Time, before liftoff, now scheduled for 6.50 a.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow morning. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Brokaw, reporting to you live from Cape Canaveral and the Kennedy Space Center, and we'll be here, back here tomorrow morning as well. And during this half hour of today, I'll be talking with two astronauts who won't be going up in that one, but may be going up in the future on one of these space shuttle flights because a lot of them are expected to take place in the next, oh, five to 10 years or so. Dr. Joe Kerwin, a medical doctor, and Judy Resnick, who has a doctorate in electrical engineering. She's one of eight women in the space program. We'll take a look at some animated NASA films and show you what this flight is expected to look like, and then we'll talk about the possibilities. The big hope, of course, here is to get this, the Columbia, off the ground successfully tomorrow, have it orbit the Earth, maybe as many as time as 54 and a half hours, and then get back safely because they want to use it again. Well, speaking of using things again, I'll be back in just a few moments, but let me say good morning to everyone in New York. Hi, folks. Good morning, Tom. You've got the glint of sunshine on your hair. I think that's a good sign, isn't it? I've got the glint of sunshine and the glint of 104 NBC lights, which they propped up about two feet out of camera range here as well. We've We've supplemented the Florida sunshine. Well, for mentioning that, we ought to give credit to the flies, too. Tom probably didn't see those. Hey, Ten, I want you to meet my two helpful experts who are here with me from NASA this morning. This is Joe Kerwin, one of the astronauts. He's an MD, a Navy flight surgeon. He was up in the Skylab 2 in 1973. And Judy Resnick is among the first women astronauts chosen in 1978 after getting her doctorate in electrical engineering. We're going to talk more with her later in this hour about being a woman and being an astronaut. Now, with their help, we're going to show you what we can expect to see tomorrow if everything works out well. We're going to take a look at some animation, some film provided by NASA of what they expect will happen when the Columbia lifts off tomorrow morning at 6.50. This is what it should look like as it takes off, and it will go into a really convulsive maneuver right off the pad, won't it, Joe? Well, I wouldn't call it convulsive, although there's a lot of vibration the instant those uh, solids come on. The crew gets shaken around in their seats pretty well for about four seconds. They immediately start a roll program to point them uprange toward the north, and then the thing begins to pitch over. Two minutes into the flight, the solid rockets are already spent. They're separated. It burns another six and a half minutes, approximately, uh, with the main engines on the shuttle. The external tank is then empty of fuel. You're not in orbit yet when the tank is uh, separated because it comes down in the ocean. So the orbiter immediately lights its own maneuvering engines, which just went off, and gives it that final uh, few hundred feet per second boost that'll get it into an orbit. Uh, there's a second burn later to circular, circularize the orbit, and about six hours after that, two more burns to raise the orbit. Now we go right to the re-entry. After the re-entry burn to slow the vehicle down, it turns way nose up, lets the bottom of it absorb the heat, and then at the, at the end, you pitch the nose down. We're looking at live film from the approach and landing test program into the lake bed runway at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, much like an aircraft, but there are no engines. This, uh, this vehicle is gliding home. You drop the wheels at the very last minute, 30 seconds before touchdown, uh, in order to save the drag. You touch down uh, on the lake bed at about uh, 200 miles an hour, 180 knots, uh, and roll out some 10,000 feet before coming to the stop. And Judy, with, this is a critical part. What people would find this hard to believe, but we're going to show you a critical part of the Columbia. These are the tiles that are on the bottom of it here as it re-enters when it's going to hit, what, temperatures of 2,500 degrees or so? Uh, yes, the temperatures can get that hot on the bottom and on the leading uh, surfaces of the wings and there's uh, 30,000 tiles on the orbiter of different construction. They're sort of like a styrofoam. They can, they can absorb 3,000 degrees of heat on one side, and yet you can pick them up on the, in the other side with your bare hand, so it protects the aluminum skin of the orbiter, prevents it from overheating and the, the re-entry. All right, we have uh, Roy Neal down in Houston this morning as well, and he's going to describe for us what they expect to be doing while they're up there in orbit. They hope that they'll be up there for 54 and a half hours altogether, about 36 orbits. Roy? 